Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Jason Fisher. I'm your host today. I'm the Central District Extension Forester and we are in Southside, Virginia in the Southern Piedmont and we're going to do Tree ID Part 2. And with me today I've got a guest, uh, Bonnie Tillotson. Bonnie is the 4-H Youth Agent in Appomattox and also has a forestry background. And Bonnie uh, volunteered and said, hey, I'd love to help you guys out, so thank you, Bonnie. She has been doing some of her own uh, videoing at some point, but uh, we have her as a guest today, and we're going to do Tree ID Part 2. So come take a walk with us. We're going to take a look at uh, some more trees that you'll find that are the most common trees, we believe, in the Southern Piedmont. All right, our first tree today is chestnut oak. And this is one, when you look in the forest, you know it by its bark. Deeply furrowed, real prominent ridges throughout. And these trees will grow on rocky ridges, poor soil. So a lot of times when you look, and they get, they get fairly big, as you can see by this specimen, even the smaller trees will get that furrowed bark. And we'll take a look at the leaf and the acorn next. Our chestnut oak leaf is aptly named because it does look just like a chestnut. Now, being in the white oak group, it's not going to have the point like you'll see with a, a red oak, but it's going to have wavy tooth margins. It's elliptical, it's wider at the center, narrow at the point, near at the bottom. What's really neat is you can see it's dark green on the surface and pale green below. They have alternate branching, as you can see, branch here, branch here. The acorn is a big acorn. You can see that valuable for wildlife, bears, squirrels, raccoons, turkeys, all love these acorns. And because it's a white oak acorn, it tends to be more palatable for those species. Now, as you saw with the big tree, these get massive. They can get up to 80 plus feet in height wonderful for uh, commercial uses, lumber. Um, so if you do have them on your property, you've got some value, not only for commercial uses, but also for wildlife. Tree number two is our fringe tree. This is a understory tree, does not get very big, maybe about 25 foot, but in the spring, beautiful showy white flowers, Pollinators absolutely love this tree. This is Chinanthus virginicus, which means snow flower of Virginia. Kind of a neat name. Now you can see with the branching here, as opposed to our chestnut oak, this is opposite branching. You can see the leaves do not have any teeth. They are smooth on the edge. Um, beautiful bright green leaves and uh, like the chestnut oak a little paler below but this is uh, an understory species and like I said valuable more for our pollinators and for our wildlife than for commercial species. All right our next tree is sassafras and what's really unique about this tree is on the same tree you will have leaves of three different shapes. You'll have the simple, you'll have the mitten shape, and then you'll have the trilobe. Sassafras has got lots of uses. Native Americans used every bit of it. The, um, the, uh, the branch, beautiful spicy aromatic, you can crush up the leaves, have a wonderful smell to them. The roots all were useful for Native Americans in their medicine. The fruits of the sassafras are a droop, kind of like our uh, black gum. They're a droop, very important for our birds, uh, turkeys, and uh, even black bears, rabbits, squirrels eat the fruit. Now, white-tailed deer will come along and browse on these twigs. They enjoy them. As far as a commercial use, um, the wood is lightweight. They can use it in boat construction. It's soft and durable. 
but this is mostly an understory tree and um, it's very important for our wildlife species. Our next tree is sourwood. As you can see by the bark, fairly smooth. You got some furrows in through here and then your white patches. Sourwood tends to be more of an understory tree. The leaves are gonna be alternate, as you can see, right there, alternate arrangement. The leaves are also a simple leaf and no kind of lobes, pretty elliptical, no teeth or anything like that. Beautiful bright green and almost the same color underneath. But the value for sourwood is for our beekeepers. The fruit, the uh, flowers of the sourwood, beautiful white droops, very fragrant flowers. Bees love these and the honey is prized by the beekeepers and beehives and the value it has for your pollinators. Our next tree is the American sycamore. And this is an easy tree to see and identify in either summer or winter. In summer, look at that leaf. Palmate, simple, got those twos going around there. The stem has like a zigzag pattern, as you can see. Again, the uh, twigs come out in an alternate arrangement. But the bark is what's really spectacular about this tree. They stand out in the winter time. They've got the, the peeling bark down below. And as you look up, you'll see where it actually has a white coloration to the bark. It'll have some blotches in there. But these trees against a bright blue sky really stand out beautiful. Um, this is also an important tree for wildlife, uh, for pollinators. The birds, the fruit is a little uh, ball and the uh, birds really enjoy that. And as far as pollinators, uh, swallowtail caterpillars will feed on the leaves. And uh, the bigger trees, because these tend to grow in bottoms, bigger trees will get uh, holes in them, uh, hollows, and wood ducks love to nest in them. Um, the wood, for commercial use, the wood does not make really good lumber, but it makes excellent butcher blocks. Two interesting facts about sycamore. One is the other name that it's used, that is used for it is buttonwood because the wood was used to make buttons. But another interesting fact was a very large old sycamore provided protection from General Washington's troops during the Battle of Brandywine um, over in Pennsylvania. And ever since, the sycamore tree has been a symbol of hope and protection. Our next tree is very easy to spot in the wintertime. This is shagbark hickory, and you can see why it gets its name. The bark peeling, um, coming off in flakes. Very, very easy to spot in a woodland setting. As far as the leaves, um, they'll have five leaflets. The top three leaflets are going to be bigger than the bottom two leaflets, and they come in an alternate pattern on there. Um, one of the interesting things about shagbark hickory, of course, everybody knows that hickory is excellent for flavoring meats. Uh, they'll try to use hickory wood in their smokers. Um, as far as wildlife uses, of course, the hickory nuts are very important for wildlife species such as bears squirrels, turkeys. Um, one thing, um, the caterpillars of the hair streak moths uh, and butterflies feed on the tree leaves, so they're important as far as pollinators. Um, but we got to remember those nuts for the wildlife. Don't pay any attention to Bella. Um, and an interesting fact, um, in Hermitage, Tennessee, which is really towards Nashville, there is the Hermitage, which is the home of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson's name was Old Hickory. That was his nickname, and that's because he was tough as an old hickory. Our next tree is post oak, which is Quercus stellata. 
one of the really distinguishing characteristics, and it is in the white oak family, so it does not have the points on the end of the leaves. You can see the lobe, but it's a cruciform shape or the shape of a cross. Very, very distinctive leaf shape. Also glossy. You can see how glossy this leaf is. The underside is a light green, and you can see it's already forming acorns. White oak acorns are very valuable for wildlife species. Now, an interesting thing about post oak is where in the world did that name come from? It came from the fact that they use this wood to make fence posts. It's got a gnarly um, growth pattern to it. It's not uh, tall and straight like some of our other oak species, but very valuable as far as for uh, fence posts. Our next tree is black gum, and black gum, you can see the furrowed gray bark right here, um, does not tend to be a really big tree like the uh, chestnut oak, a little more of an understory tree. This one's a very healthy specimen. The leaves, you can see uh, elliptical, smooth, simple, um, real pretty greenish color. Now look at the twigs. You can see where it's got the reddish tint on the twig. Uh, that's kind of a giveaway for black gum also. But its value is really in the fall. Beautiful coloration, oranges and reds, they just shine. Also black gum will have a droop as a fruit. It'll ripen to a bluish purplish color, very valuable for wildlife species. And uh, black gum, the um, genus and species is Nyssa sylvatica. This is the fruit of our black gum. And you can see, now normally when it matures, it's going to be a dark purplish or bluish color. But right now these are immature. You can see the leaf right here. It's smooth margin, no lobes or anything to it. And you can see the alternate arrangement of the leaves and the twigs. Our next tree is white ash, Fraxinus americana. Now this tree has opposite branching, which you can see also right here. It's a compound leaf with normally seven leaflets. And what's unusual about this tree is it's alive. Um, our emerald ash borer, which was an invasive pest, has pretty much decimated most of the ash species in the woodlands here in Virginia and other states. Um, ash, of course, the uses, one of the big uses that everybody thinks of is baseball bats. Um, wonderful baseball bats and we hope that uh, once the emerald ash borer is done, uh, the small ashes that remain can grow up to be large and healthy.